the validatory address and representing the board we have with us Mr. T.V. Sesha Sai, Secretary and Treasurer, PMI Bangalore India Chapter. There he is. If there is one mystery that has left the analyst baffled is how does India surges ahead given its size multiplied by complexity. One lesson that we have learned in the last five years of digital transformation is we need solutions that can handle this. Aadhaar is a shining example of providing personal identity and associated services to every 1.2 billion Indians at an imaginably low cost. And as said by Gandhiji, any revolution that does not touch every Indian is doomed from start. Let me call upon our validatory speaker, Dr. Pallab Saha, President, Association of Enterprise Architects and Advisor to the Ministry of Electronics and IT Government of India, who will unravel this mystery of how India is doing its part of his talk titled Enterprise Architecture and Digital Transformation, Furthering Digital India in a Complex Landscape. Dr. Pallab Saha has been identified as a thought leader by IBM Smart City Connect and featured by Forbes. He is an advisor to the Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India, a key member in the National Committee for Enterprise Architecture, a co-author of the India Enterprise Architecture Framework, previously at head of uh, Wipro's Government and Public Sector, uh, Sector Architecture Practice. He was instrumental in creating a government-focused architecture domain. He was he has published five books on enterprise architecture and has delivered 110 plus keynote sessions at prominent forums, seminars and conferences worldwide in recognition of his expertise and contribution. He is a two-time recipient of the Microsoft Research Grant supported by the UN. He holds a PhD in Information Systems from ISC and is an alumnus of the MIT Sloan Executive Program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pallab Saha. First of all, I'd like to thank PMI Bangalore for giving me an opportunity to speak here on this very important initiative that I'm sure all of you would have heard of because this is the mother of all digital transformation projects that is currently going on in India for various reasons. One is, of course, uh, I assume that a lot of you do come from the tech industry and uh, you're probably more interested about the technology that is being used. Uh, and the second part is, as citizens of this country, we also get impacted uh, and um, the MC was talking about Aadhaar, so when Aadhaar, uh, you know, when a bank uses Aadhaar to do your KYC, that is digital India, uh, that is digital transformation. Uh, when you download an app, uh, you know, from Umang, that is digital transformation. When you want your kids or you yourself want to take admission to a university or a college, and instead of giving a paper certificate, you just provide the digital ID of your e-certificate that the CBSC or the ICFC will provide to the university. So it's basically a certificate-less uh, governance. So that is Digital India. And uh, the reason why this is very interesting is because a lot of people ask me, uh, you know, we've heard about this term called digital transformation, and I'm completely cognizant of the fact that this, the theme of this conference is architecting project management and embracing disruptions. I'm going to speak about architecture in the context of how it fits in the overall scheme of digital transformation as we see uh, you know, in the, in the uh, crux of Digital India as an initiative. And I'm going to talk about something that has been happening and we are actually in the process of rolling out. So even as we speak, it's not that as if that the project is over or the initiative is over. Even as we speak, things are being rolled out and I'm going to talk about that as we move along. Now, I don't have to tell you that there is a huge amount of adoption of digital technologies in India uh, in many ways. However, what happens is a lot of people ask me, what is the difference between the way we have done technology, for instance, the IT service providers who have been doing or providing technology services versus digital India? And to me, the simple, in, simple difference is that when you provide services to another country, which is precisely what IT services organizations do, your focus is primarily efficiency, right? Basically, you have to deliver your technology solution faster and cheaper. You can't have faster, better, and cheaper, because as the you know, saying says, you pick any two. You can't get all the three. So basically, it is faster and cheaper. But when you talk of digital transformation, and especially in the context of digital India, the focus is more Less on efficiency, yes, efficiency is important, we do need efficient solutions, but the focus is more on effectiveness. 
You heard the example from the previous speaker. The most important fact there is how effective this screening solution is. Efficiency is important, but if a farmer wants to know, get a weather alert from, you know, from, from the Department of Agriculture saying that there's going to be a storm now or there's going to be a drought, can I actually anticipate that solution using technology and actually give something to the farmer? That's basically effectiveness. So therefore, it's important to understand the difference between how we have, I won't say adopted technology, how we have been basically a supplier of technology to other countries versus how we have to consume technology to address the problems that we have, the priorities that we have. That's fundamentally the difference between these two generations, if you will, you know, how things have been in the past 30, 40 years, and I'll show you some data later on, versus what is the, uh, what is the scenario that we are basically contextualizing in the context of digital India. Now, <clears throat> you go to any state government, any ministry, typically there are lots of solutions, I'm not going to list out all the solutions there, right? Uh, Every state, for instance, Karnataka itself will have a wide area network. It has a service delivery gateway. There's a state data center. There are some e-district solutions. Uh, there are some common solutions which focus more on the common functions of HR, finance, workflow management, so on and so forth. So I'll not go you know, into the details of that. And you go to any state, any ministry, roughly, they are all same. Right? I mean, I've analyzed almost every state and every ministry. Roughly, they are all same, 80%. But if you go and talk to the state or the ministry, they will vehemently say, no, we are very different. 90% of governance that happens in this country, the services that the government provides, is actually similar across the country. Right? Do you know that every state, if you go and analyze the kind of digital services or e-services, I will not use the word digital service, that the government provides, or any state government or any ministry provides, is basically providing certificates. It's providing a certificate for your right from birth then for marriage, then for college, then for if you're below poverty line, then for caste, then if you want income certificate. Basically, these are all papers that exist. Basically, they are providing data existing in one government department as a printout so that you can provide that same piece of paper to, to consume another service from the government. When you give your 10th standard mark sheet to the passport office, the passport office is not interested to know how much you scored in chemistry in your 10th marks, in your 10th standard. It just wants to know your date of birth. But in the process, what is happening is that you, as citizens, you and me, we become the couriers. We carry paper given by one department of the government, take it out, and stand in queue to give it to another department, because those departments refuse to talk to one another. Okay, have you all experienced this? Okay. So, it is very fragmented, there is no interoperability, so what I explained to you before was just the common man's experience, and this is all the, you know, the jargons that we typically use. Usually there is a mix of legacy and new technologies, coupled with very limited internal expertise, so there are very few IT experts within the government setup, except a few exceptions that we can speak about later on. Uh, many of the solutions and services the government departments provide are very inward-oriented. Because this is how my department or my ministry is organized, and that's the kind of service I'm going to provide. Okay? Number of transactions is the primary success criteria. So if you go to any government website, the first thing you will see that we have five crore transactions. Who cares? Did it change the life of the farmers? How much, you know, in many cases what happens is you will even have very conflicting outcomes that different departments are actually tracking. Let me give you an example, right? Every state has a revenue department which wants to figure out how much revenue it is getting out of taxes. And every revenue department, every state revenue department, is very keen to know how much revenue it is getting from sales of liquor and tobacco. But the Department of Health runs ads even on your TV screens and movie theaters saying that smoking is injurious to health, and they're spending money on it. So who should succeed? Should the revenue department succeed or the Department of Health should succeed? Because if I say I actually discourage people from smoking and drinking, the revenue department will say, it affected my revenue, what will I do? Right? You can see the conflicting interests that exist between different departments and ministries. 
And that creates a lot of problems. We'll get to that a little later on. So there is no whole of government thinking. Uh, significant effort is needed to collate uh, information and make decisions. Basically, for bureaucrats, it's not easy. You've heard the IPS officer earlier in the morning. I'm sure he's already shared a lot of his pain points, right, Mr. Sanjay Sahai? And very importantly is that there is this prevalence of not invented here. If one state comes up with a solution, if one ministry comes up with a solution, the other states will say, actually with a lot of pride, that I did not do, I did not repeat what Karnataka did. I actually rebuilt, reinvented the wheel. Now that is a recipe for disaster, because the only way you can scale up is by standardizing. There is a reason why we have a pan-India pan -India, Indian railways, that a train from Kochi can go to Kohima. And the reason is that the, the gauge width is standardized. Everything else, you know, is decided by what is the gauge width. Standardization, you must read this book called The Box. It was written in 19, well, it was published in 1990s, but it was about the story of how three people came together and said, we need to standardize the dimensions of the shipping container. All of you have seen a shipping container, right? Because once the three dimensions of the shipping container were standardized, after that, everything got standardized. How the ships were built, the shipyards, the, you know, where the, the, you know, where the shipping container was stored, everything was standardized. And it contributed to about three trillion dollars of world economy. That's the power of standardization. We don't believe in standardization. The problem is, if we keep our energies, waste our energies, reinventing the wheel, then we do not know, after the wheel is invented, where to go. Because we have 10 hours of time, we have spent every time, all of us are reinvent reinventing the wheel, reinventing the wheel, reinventing the wheel. After that, there is no destination to go. Okay? All right. And I'm not saying this. It comes from the topmost person in this country. He's obviously talking about the health sector, I and mean, you've seen one example from the health sector already. But that's true across all sectors, be it education, be it transportation, be it agriculture, horticulture, tourism, doesn't matter. Silos exist. Today, if I want an integrated view of any ministry or government or any department, this is the only way I can get it. The reaction I typically get after showing this is that in many cases, even those lines don't exist. <laughs> because the existence of the line is not a technical problem, it is a political problem. Right? So, this was the essence of basically what Digital India was all about. And you can actually read the full article there, right? That the link is provided there, but let me move, move along. So this is where Digital India, so it started in 2014. I've given you some examples of the, uh, the initiatives that happened in the first five years. And now, with the continuation of the government, uh, you know, we have the Digital India version 2.0, which is focusing on four pillars. We have the enterprise architecture at the top, we have the digital standard, service standard number two, national program on AI. We've speak, I, I think during this conference, you've seen many case studies of use of AI, so I'll skip that part. And finally, how all of these three pillars are going to contribute to the overall digital transformation and building a digital economy for the country. All right? Okay. I know we have a lot of people here from the construction industry, so I'm sure you'll be able to you know, relate to this. A lot of people tell me, why do you need architecture? Because I can build an application and launch it within seven days. I said, absolutely. Your phone will have 500 apps. At the end of the day, it will look like this. Because they were never designed to work together. There is nothing, there is no overall umbrella holding them together. And at the national level, we cannot do that, right? Therefore, you need an architecture and some of the benefits of architecture. It's no rocket science that architecture is actually, not having architecture is actually more resource intensive. And we really need to use our resources efficiently, and therefore you need an architecture. 
Okay, so that's the basic value of having architecture and not having architecture and some of the consequences of each of those extremes, if you will, in terms of how architecture comes in. Now, a lot of people ask me, and I'm sure some of you do come from the tech industry, whenever you mention, I'm sure you, you have architect, some kind of architect in your designation, right, job title. Most of you are talking about this. The technology part of the architecture, I'm not saying this is not important, but what is important is this, because this drives this. You have to understand why you are doing what you are doing. All right? And obviously, there are certain policies and practices that need to be put in place. Aadhaar is not a technical solution anymore. I'm sure we've already experienced many of the legal you know, issues that it gets into because it becomes a legal political issue after some point. It's no more a technical issue, right? Nobody says, you know, other is going to be hosted on the cloud. I mean, who cares? Probably it is, and we all know it is, right? Uh, obviously, every government or every entity of the government needs to have some kind of mission. The government is there to provide governance. Government is not there to provide, you know, government is not a technology company. There may be elements of governments who are a technology company, but at the whole, is it going to make a difference to the quality of my life? That's more important. All right? So this is important, but obviously this enterprise architecture, which is the more important part, drives the, the solution that you come up with to deliver that enterprise architecture. Okay, I'll skip a few slides. So, Therefore, there was this launch of India Enterprise Architecture, and the reason and the motivation was the bullet number one there. We have been a provider of services for 30 to 40 years, but as you heard in the previous statement, Gandhiji said it must touch the lives of every Indian citizen. The problem was that 30, 40 years of IT service provider ecosystem did not touch any, most of the people. It may have touched a few lakhs mid-collar workers who were providing services for other countries. Right? Because there we were supplying technology to other countries. It did not make any difference except that how many H1 visas does US give. Whereas, in terms of consuming technologies, there is a survey done by the United Nations, and we rank number 96 in the world. Because that is talking about how technology is used to make a difference to people's lives. And there we have, we have a lot of catching up to do. So that was the basic trigger of doing Digital India. Of course, there's a few more other things that's important. There was a committee set up. It was notified as a national standard. Okay, all of that paraphernalia that happened as a result of the first bullet there. There are countries where enterprise architecture is mandated by law. You don't do it as an extracurricular activity, which is typical in the tech industry. Do a shoddy job of requirements and start coding, because if you're not coding, you're not billable. <laughs> architecture and design is done if you get time. Your manager will say, yeah, I cannot bill you for architecture and design, so do it after 7 p.m. <laughs> of your own interest. No other industry thinks like us. Well, when I say the tech industry. Okay, so there are countries where doing architecture is mandated by law. If not, you could get into trouble. That's as Simple as that. So I'll not go into the details there. So the India framework consists of eight domains. I'm only going to focus on the top two domains because that's important from the context that we have here. So the first domain is priorities, performance. What are your mission goals, priorities, decisions, and outcomes? And then followed by the business domain, which basically realizes your goals and performance indicators, the processes. After that, you have the data application infrastructure, the technology infrastructure, governance, management, security. Important, but given the limitation of time, we are going to focus only on the you know, uh, top two, because that will tell you why we are doing what we are doing. Okay. So the technical or the official definition of government enterprise architecture is a whole of government approach to support government ecosystems by transcending boundaries to deliver services in a coordinated, efficient, and equitable manner. Today, I cannot provide a digital service that cannot be consumed by an illiterate farmer. Okay? Now, what we have actually seen is that before an far before a illiterate person becomes physically literate, he or she becomes digitally literate. He or she can actually use a smartphone. Because the UI or the UX, as we call it now, is so smart. 
So it is not really an obstacle in terms of consuming services that the government provides. And the underlying methodology that we use for the NDA framework is this TOGAF, the architecture development methodology. It's a step-by-step -step approach. I'll skip the details. All of the details are actually available. But it basically tells you how do you architect you know, for a specific department or a ministry or an entire country. First one is the performance model. Very complex picture. Effectively, what this performance model tells you is these fundamental questions. What do you want to measure and monitor? How frequently do you want to measure and monitor? What methods are you going to use? Who's going to report the results? How are you going to analyze the results that you're going to get? All of this is fundamental governance-related questions. Nothing to do with technology. Every bureaucrat will want something like this. So that's your first layer, if you remember, the roof of the house, if you will, right? Then you have the business layer, which basically tells you how do you organize the business of government. Okay? And here we provide some guidance so that the state governments and ministries don't reinvent the wheel all the time. And this is the basic structure of, as an example, of a state government. This is fundamentally what, a, what state governments do. Give or take a few lines here and there. Right? Now, at this level, obviously, it tells you how the business of government is organized, but it's not very useful because I really want to drill down to see how is it going to make a difference to a farmer's life, for instance. So let me take the primary sector, and within the primary sector, let me take agriculture. So this is the performance layer of the agriculture for... So this is basically a real example from the you know, agriculture department. Uh, so these are the goals that the agriculture department has identified. Double-digit growth, okay, gross value add, timely benefits to par farmers, improve income, improve resilience, finance, access to all, improve quality and traceability. At the end of the day, if the technology, underlying technology, cannot achieve those six goals, it's of no use. All right? Everything else is details, right? I'll skip the details here. So if you go one level down, this shows you the same, you know, same example. So this is the state government. Okay, this is the state government in the center, and it shows you what are the other departments it is interacting with. So you, as a department, you don't exist in isolation. You have to interact with other departments of your same organization. In this case, the organization is the state government. So for instance, you have PR and rural development, food and civil supplies, of course, finance, planning, so on and so forth. Now, if you look at it from a farmer's perspective, getting a service, this is the kind of complexity that a farmer who's probably illiterate or semi-literate has to go through to consume the services. In many cases, we know that people in the rural area don't even know that they qualify for subsidies. Okay, so it gives you a flavor of what, how we analyze, right? At a, you know, with a real example that is actually going on at this point. Now, going back to the original side, so these are the six uh, goals that we identified, for instance, and I can actually play out everything, but I'll just show you one and then just go through the animation. So this is, how do you improve farmer's income? For instance, double, you know, doubling farmer's income. A farmer needs better, better access to information, any kind of information, soil information, weather information, any kind of information, right, is useful to the farmer. What are the solutions? Now you're coming to solution architecture. You remember that picture? So these are the solutions that are required, and they can be enabled by technology. As a result of those solutions, what are the impacts you're going to get? So here is one example. Okay. Now, as I said, just this is a sample. Let me just play out everything else and show you the full slide. In the interest of time, yeah. So this is the full slide. So you can see exactly, when you play out the animation, exactly how you're linking a goal to an impact at the farmer level. And all of this is being enabled by technology, which is highlighted in the next slide. Now I decide that I, therefore, have to come up for a solution with better access to information. Let's stay with the first bullet there, right? And therefore, I need to provide some kind of rural advisory service to the farmer. I can send in experts, say, hey, you know what, this is the nature of the soil and this is the kind of crop you need to have. Do you need one crop a year, two crop a year, multi-crops, whatever it is? You provide some advice. So you write the use case, 
you look at the workflows and now very importantly, I build the solution using these things called building blocks. Okay, look at building blocks as a best analogy for that is, let's take any language, let's take the language of English. What is the fundamental building block of any language? The alphabets, there are 26 alphabets. The alphabets are put together to create words, and there are some rules to do that. And the words are put together to create sentences, and that's called, rules are called grammar. That's it. If I want to invent a new word, let's take selfie, as a word did not exist five years back, I did not come up with the 27th alphabet, right? I could do it within that 26 alphabets. Same thing here. As an architect, enterprise architect, all you do is put these reusable building blocks together to create that solution, to address all of the problems which I showed you earlier. And where do these building blocks come from? That's in the next slide. These are the building blocks. All right, so you take the capabilities as you want. You know exactly that block provides me that capability. For instance, to provide rural advisory services, I need to take appointment. There's an appointment service. Take this as a you know, building block and build the use case. Okay, so now we are rolling out all of these boxes. As you can see, there are some boxes in dotted lines, so they are in progress, but these are going to be made available across all ministries, across all states, so that the important point is that the states can focus on what they need to do or what they ought to do. That is governance, not building, it, you know. You heard the story in the morning already. Okay? <clears throat> Architecture provides traceability. If there is a change in policy, today there is a, there is a policy, let's say the government, be it the state government or the central government, says that there is a change in policy, the important or the benefit of architecture is, therefore, I can have the line of sight to see what is the impact at the project level. All of you are PMs, so you definitely need to know. What is the impact at the process level, service level? What is the impact at the application level, data level, and the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure level? That is the benefit of doing architecture. It's basically traceability, line of sight. In most cases, what happens is this line of sight does not exist. So if there is a change in policy, all of us are scrambling to figure out what is the impact. Okay? All right. So this is the second one, which is very important. I'm sure you've heard of this term very, very often. What is a digital service? Right? So we actually came up with a standard, which is a national standard now, digital service standard, and the first thing that we did was we had to define what a digital service is. I'll show you the definition later on. So basically this standard talks of digital service across its entire life cycle, how you define a service, how you realize a service, how you measure a service, and how you govern a service. And for each of these phases, there are sub-phases, sub-activities also. You don't have to take pictures at all. All of these documents are available on the Digital India website. It's an, these are official documents. These are public documents. Just go to the Digital India portal and download this entire document, okay? Now, I'm going to take one example. For instance, define. So this is defining a digital service. How do you describe a service? What is the classification? What is the prioritization? So those are the activities. Then you go to the attributes objective of the digital service, scope, and service level, right? And then the principles and standards. So each of the four phases have a similar view, and each of this basically consists of you shall do this, you shall not do this, this is mandatory, this is a recommendation, this is suggested, so on and so forth. Remember, it's a standard, right? You need to conform to the standard. Okay. In addition to this, there's one thing very important for us to understand this. We have spoken about Aadhaar. Other is basically a digital identity of a person, of a human being, but that's not enough. You need digital identity of businesses, devices, things. All of these things have to come together if you really want to provide a fully digitized service. So therefore, in the digital service standard, we have given a lot of importance on what is the digital identity that a government needs to define for itself, and given recommendations. 
All right? So where does EA reside within the context of digital transformation? I said, I'll give you a definition of digital service. You'll see that here. See, on the top, we have the different players in the digital transformation ecosystem. You have consumers like us. You have providers. You have, of course, government, you have aggregators. You know what an aggregator is, right? Ola is an aggregator. It doesn't own any taxis. And, you have, of course, you need investors. Because remember, when you're talking of digital transformation, it's about basically contributing to the economy itself. It's not just about government. There, is a many, there are many other parameters besides the government. The second layer is the digital service attribute. Basically, a digital service is any service that is personalized to my needs, that is paperless, you've heard this before, that is cashless, that is presenceless. If I want to consume a service end-to-end, -end, I don't need to see the face of a human being. That's a fully digitized service. It is frictionless. It means that if it requires interaction or interoperation between different ministries and departments, that's an internal issue. The citizen is not made to run around from door to door. Effectively, what frictionless means is that there is no wrong door. You go to Department of Health asking for a municipal service, the department should not say, you know what, I'm the health department, I'm not supposed to do this. To me, that is government, period. Okay? And it is consent-based. Very important, specifically in the health area or in the you know, specific domain areas, that is very important. If anybody wants to use my health data, for instance, he or she or that entity has to take my consent. Have you used DigiLocker as an example? Anybody? Right? Yes. If DigiLocker gives that information to a consuming organization, you get a note on your handphone saying that somebody has accessed your information and that is the purpose. But that is only after you give a consent that, yes, I give the consent that this my mark sheet can be accessed the universe at the, these universities because that is required for admission purposes. That's digital service. To enable that digital service, you need architecture. We have spoken about that, but the important point is to enable that architecture, the three main pillars, you need institutions and governance. This is not going to happen if there, are, there is no leadership support. All right? Obviously, we need ecosystems, we need accountability and co coordination, we need business and IT to work together, we need standards and guidelines. I've spoken about that. But for you, especially in the context of the audience that we have here, this is absolutely critical. DevOps becomes more successful if it is driven by architecture. All right? We need risk management, portfolio management, all of you understand that. We need multi-speed delivery because there will be entities within the government who will be slow to adopt technologies. But there will also be entities who will be fast to adopt technologies. All right, and finally, we need operational mastery. We need to know how the operations are going to run. And for that, there are certain things that need to be done. I'm going to focus on that a little later. Okay. The important point here is, in this picture, there are eight layers, so there's a strategy here, that one layer ecosystem, attributes, enterprise architecture, these three pillars here, and platform there. Now, what is important is, and a lot of people ask me, what happens if I don't have one of those layers? Because it's not easy for any government entity to actually have all of these layers in place, running in synergy. Right? So let me show you how it plays out if you don't have each of those layers. Nothing much to explain. You can see it means that the digital strategy layer is not there, and that's the impact. So each of the layer missing successively, right? And that's the impact of one layer missing. Uh, if you have more than one layer missing, then all the best. Okay? So ideally, you should have all of these things to make your digital transformation work. That's the message that we are talking from this uh, you know, slide, which is actually taken from one of the documents which I already mentioned, available within the Digital India portal. All right. 
Now, you already know that there is a target. I think some of you do know that we have a target by 2025 of one trillion dollars of digital economy. Did you know that? Okay, good. So what are the contributors to that? Few things. All of these things, we need to get our infrastructure in place, so that's why you see some of these things that are being put in place that I spoke about, touched about, rather. You need firms, digital firms, who can use that infrastructure, okay? And then, of course, you need wider digital adoption. The reason why adoption is important, um, you remember how, I mean, obviously, GST is now a you know, part of life, for us, especially for organizations, is definitely a part of life. But for us to adopt certain things, the difference now is, it makes a difference in the way we behave. If I'm looking at a cashless economy, suddenly the shopkeeper says, if you pay more than 50,000 rupees, I'm not going to take cash. It needs a change in my behavior, as well as the shopkeepers or whoever, the store manager behavior. So the adoption is nothing to do with technology, it's all about how we behave and how we embrace new technologies. All right, final thoughts. So we sat together and identified certain strategic success factors to make this happen. As I said, this is currently in progress. Okay, we are talking about rolling out across ministries, across states, so there are many states who are doing it. And unfortunately, Karnataka is probably lagging behind at this point. I wouldn't say probably it is lagging behind at this point. Okay, first is we need a national aspiration, right? When the prime minister says we need to send an Indian out on space, that's aspiration. As a country, we celebrate individual success, but not national success. We need a national aspiration, and that's what Digital India brings. I told you the ranking, right? The ranking basically was 96, is still 96, and we're targeting to get within the top 30 by 2030. You need big picture perspective. Okay, it's all good to bark the trees, all that is fine, but you have to see the forest. And that's very important. That's the first success factor, and that is already being put in place as I made this presentation. Number two, just aspiring is not enough. You need political support and funding. Put the money where your mouth is. That is available now. It is not a problem. Then you need a rallying point and champions for good governance. Basically, this is about improving the quality of life of people. I'm sure that was very clear in the previous presentation from Niramai. It is not about the AI, it is not about the ML, it is about being effective in screening cancers so that you can save lives, period. When we do architecture, you saw domain knowledge is very important. You have to know how agriculture department works, you have to know how health department works, you have to know how transportation department works, depends on what domain you're talking of. Expectation management is important, as I said, and I'm sure there have been presentations in this conference about change management, and I'm sure there are some workshops also around that topic. It's very important to manage the expectations at all levels, all stakeholders be it consumers, be it government, be it investors, be it aggregators, whoever it is, everybody has an expectation that needs to be managed. Scale, speed, and systemic approach. You must understand that some of these projects are hugely disruptive. You cannot follow the approach of let's do a pilot, let's make the pilot successful and then we will scale it up. It does not work because there are vested interests. There are, I'm sure you know, there are people in this country, companies, organizations, individuals, who do not want Aadhaar to succeed, who do not want GST to succeed. So how do you roll out? Do a mass rollout, even if there is a change of government, it cannot be undone. The cost of undoing is very high. When Dr. Manmohan Singh, when Dr. Manmohan Singh opened up the Indian economy, right, we supported it. But when he, even when that political party went out of power, the next political party could not undo it because it is so big. It is already adopted, so we cannot have this pilot-by-pilot pilot approach and then pray that it will work. Okay? Standards, we have spoken about standards already, but the important point is rapid propagation of practices. Communication and governance, very important how you communicate. Um, the first state in this country 
to do this, do a statewide enterprise architecture was Andhra Pradesh. The project was called E Pragati, and there is a reason why it's called E Pragati because Pragati itself actually talks about development and progress, so on and so forth. So that was an example of how you can brand basically a initiative to make it more acceptable by the common people. We need expertise and capacity building. So, for instance, now this topic is being taught to bureaucrats. You know, when when a when a bureaucrat gets selected into the civil services, they go to a school called LBS Academy in Missouri. I'm sure you've heard of that, LBS NAA. This topic is now taught there because they are aware. They don't need to be expert architects. All they need to know is how is it going to help his or her governance. Okay, so it's now there. It's already been talked about multiple times in that academy. And finally, we do need the industry and ecosystem to support this because this is a different way. A lot of people ask me, how do I contribute? I say the only way you can contribute end-to-end -end in a digital transformation project is only in your own country. Because in another country, you're only a foreigner. They will only expose you to the specific block that is you know, relevant for them and then pay you for that service. But it's only in India that you can get access to all of those building blocks that I showed you earlier. Okay, so it's important for us to you know, bring the industry and bring the entire ecosystem to make this happen. So these are some of the strategic success factors. All of these are being tackled. We have not reached, you know, many of these things are work in progress, as I said, but I think it gives you a flavor of where we are going and uh, what we are trying to do. I think with that, I will finish my presentation. Uh, these documents are all available in the Digital India portals. If you're online right now, you can go ahead and download it. All of these are available because eventually, if you come from the industry, you will get impacted because these are all mandated standards now. So if you are doing any work, either directly with the government entity or indirectly, because now the entities are going to ask, are you following DSS, for instance, Digital Service Standard, so on and so forth. So it's important that you download this document and see what is there. All right, thank you very much. This is from, uh, I hope I get the name right, Goraknath, with all the enterprise architecture and solutions that are provided through e-government initiatives. Mm -hmm. Can the actual delivery of service be monitored for real-time effectiveness? And can this architecture fix accountability for non-delivery. Yes, so uh, one of the things that is happening is that now uh, there is a element of creating scorecards so that all of these delivery can be tracked. And once there is a, you know, l let's say there is a bottleneck saying that some department or somebody is actually slowing down the delivery of the service, there are therefore certain, you know, actions to be taken. That is already happening, I think the accountability part, this government is definitely addressing that. You've heard what happened to Commissioner of Tax just last week, right? So, you know, I'll not belabor that, but I'm sure we all read the same newspapers, so you know what is already happening. But that's yes. kind of a one-off a case, right? Yeah, pardon me? That's kind of a one-off a case. No, not at all. I think no? it's institutionalized. Now. Wow, that's yes. good. Yes. Question is uh, from uh, Prasanna. Any efforts with respect to electric vehicle, especially in charging standards and billing and delivery i what is the question any uh, efforts with respect to electric vehicles especially in the charging standards charging standards yeah i guess the what, charging the, for what digital services or charging the electric, electric vehicle electric me yeah uh, that's a very specific question yes the point is see you must understand that uh, some of these things cannot be achieved without adoption of standards and very importantly, whether it is being, you know, you know, charging of mobile phones, even the chargers need to be standard or electrical sockets or even standards for, I gave you the example of railway standards for digital services, all are standards driven. That's fundamental. The problem is not uh, standards per se, but what is important is we need to develop standards for our own country, right? In many cases, what happens is when I say, you know, when I see, right, you know what, I'm, my company is CMMI level 5, but CMMI was not written for us. It was written by Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute for contractors, defense contractors. Our companies just adopted it. Where is our standard? Right, as I say, in the standards domain, we are fundamentally a downloading nation. We are not an uploading nation. Do you know what the difference is? 
we have to become an uploading nation. We have to write standards that others can follow. Look how people in space agencies in other countries are following what ISRO is doing. On Monday, we have a milestone coming up. <laughs> That's why I say, right, the first bullet there is important, national aspiration. Right? Yes. Dr. Pallab, uh, I think I'll make uh, things easier for you. Probably we'll uh, just ask in yes or no, okay? Yeah. Shri Arsha from IBM, this is the question from him. Are state government obligated to adopt and follow these structures being built? Yes or no? There are many ways to make it. Of course, you can make it mandatory. We have not gotten to a point where it will become a law, but at some point, yes, it could become a regulation. But there are other ways also to make it obligatory to state governments or ministries to adopt it. Because So one way to do is, is to encourage them with funding, to provide them additional capabilities. Yes, there are many ways to do that. And we are at this point exploring all of those mechanisms to make it happen. But having said that, we still are not in a position where we want to scare the state government saying that, yeah, there is this sword hanging over my head and I have to just, you know, qualify for that or conform to that. But eventually it's going to happen. You are going to see. That is point. eventually, right? Yes. Now in the context of uh, the similar, I think I should say it's a related one, you know. Yes. In a, cor in a corporate structure itself, it is tough to make people understand the enterprise architecture. So how do you think it's going to be possible in the government? It's easier in the government. Really? It's easier in the government because you know, what has happened is in the past 10, 15 years, the way the, the, this concept has been communicated, basically a lot of people have understood as, uh, I do enterprise architecture to build new systems. That is not why you do enterprise architecture. That's why I showed you that slide. The reason you do bet is enterprise architecture is because you want to provide better services which makes a difference to people's lives. And bureaucrats and senior level government officials understand this. That's important. If you keep talking about technology, nobody cares. Imagine that farmer example, right? And you go say, I'm going to host your solution on the cloud. The farmer will be looking up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I agree. It's the cloud, right? I know in the interest of time, let's give a huge round of applause for Dr. Pallab Saha. And I now 